Now I understand that some of you have uh, watched my work before on YouTube. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah, if you have, just want to let you know that this show is very different from what you've previously seen me do. Uh, there's no social commentary because the world is fucked and I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think we should all just embrace our privilege and survive the BJP. <laughs> yeah. So this show uh, is very personal. It's about the last eight years of my life. Uh, in a way that you could possibly relate to, you know. So what I do is I go back to different points in those last eight years, and I start off with 2016 uh, because that's when I got news that really changed things for me. Um, I got diagnosed with anxiety disorder. Yeah, you should try it. <laughs> now clap your hands if you've ever had to deal with a mental illness, anxiety, or depression. <laughs> good, good. You know the Indian comedy scene has evolved when we move from saying stuff like clap your hands if you're Gujarati. <laughs> to clap your hands if you have a mental illness. <laughs> Come a long way. And the thing is, I, I didn't know much about mental illness. Like I, like I knew it existed, but I, I was very ignorant about it. Like people would say stuff to me, like, oh, he's depressed. And I'd be like, why? Is his Wi-Fi not working? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty close, right? Like, I didn't understand. I was damn ignorant. And then I got diagnosed. And to be really honest, when I got the news, part of me was kind of happy because now I finally have a thing. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to socialize these days? Everybody has a thing. You know what I mean? Right? Like a quirk that they're all bonding over. Like, I have never had a thing. I used to always feel left out. Yeah, it's hard being perfect. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? You go to a party, you meet people, they're like, Hi, I'm allergic to shellfish. <laughs> Please don't give me shellfish. And you're like, yes, my friend, he's allergic to shellfish. You know, don't, don't give him any shellfish. Or you meet somebody else and you'll be like, Oh, I have vertigo, I'm afraid of heights. And you're like, yes, my friend, she has vertigo, she's afraid of heights. Or you'll meet somebody else and you'll be like, Hi, I'm vegan. <laughs> And you just go, this person is not my friend. <laughs> so the thing is, I, I had to figure out what was going on with me, OK? Because this is not an illness where you just pop a couple of pills and you're OK in a week, you know? This thing stays with you, all right? So I had to do a lot of reading up, and I spoke to a lot of professionals. And it turns out that besides a lot of external factors in your life, it mostly has to do with serotonin. Yeah, serotonin is a nine-letter word which when played in Scrabble is a guaranteed triple word score. <laughs> Scrabble is a game played by people who know how to spell, but just want to show off. Now, serotonin is also a chemical that is produced by your body, right? And this chemical is responsible for regulating your moods and your emotions. So if your serotonin levels are healthy, then your brain is healthy and your mind is your best friend. But if your serotonin levels are messed up, then you could end up having a mental illness like anxiety or depression. And then your mind becomes your worst enemy. And trust me when I say this, nothing is scarier than having to fight your own mind. When you have a mental illness, every single day is a battle. On some days, I love my life. And then on others, I just can't get out of bed. I shut down emotionally, worry about things that are not likely to happen. And I'm tortured and paralyzed by my own thoughts. It's like you know how to swim, yet you're drowning but you don't die. Yeah. Like, regular stuff that you guys take for granted is so difficult for us to do. I'll give you an example. You guys like ice cream? Yeah? Everybody likes ice cream. Have you noticed when you decide to do something, you always have a quick chat with your mind? If you're a healthy person, you just go, hey, mind, look, ice cream. Let's get some ice cream. Good idea. <laughs> Here's how the exact same conversation plays out with me. Hey, mind, look, ice cream. Let's get some ice cream. You're going to die. <laughs> what? You know those terminal illnesses you've heard about? You have them. All of them. I just want ice cream. And it's because of thoughts like these, I spent a better part of 2016 convinced that I was going to die. Not eventually, like you guys. <laughs> In Bombay. But soon, 
and that scared the shit out of me, so I didn't know what to do. So I would keep going to this one particular hospital, and I would do random medical tests, because WebMD. <laughs> <laughs> the test would always come back negative, because there was nothing wrong with me, but my mind refused to accept it, so I would keep going back again and again, until the hospital staff were finally convinced that their equipment was faulty. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, he has something. <laughs> we just don't know how to find it. <laughs> Science has not evolved that far. <laughs> Ganpati Bappa. <laughs> the thoughts wouldn't go away. Wake up in the morning, the first thing I would hear is a voice telling me that I was going to die. Every single day. I, I, and then I didn't know what to do. And then I found out that there are these people who have studied the human mind and they're trained to deal with mental illness. They have strange names, uh, so... I keep forgetting, and I write them down. <laughs> they call psychiatrists and, and psychologists. Have you heard of these magical people from Narnia? <laughs> See, I figured if you have an illness of the mind, you should go to a doctor of the mind. So I went into therapy, and it was very helpful. It was so helpful, I now recommend therapy to everyone. Even if there's nothing wrong with you, go for therapy. <laughs> you think about this, therapy is a brilliant social construct. You're sitting across a total stranger, telling them your deepest, darkest secrets, and then paying them a lot of money <laughs> to keep those secrets. <laughs> this would have been so much simpler if our friends were easy to trust. <laughs> Most therapy uh, is expensive. I remember the first time I called up a clinic to book an appointment, and they told me how much it would cost. I was like, I feel better already. <laughs> First session was free. <laughs> but after being in therapy for a while, I've come to realize that besides the counseling sessions, literally anything that makes you happy in life counts as therapy. Anything. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, my friend. <laughs> anything. What's your name, buddy? Shitaj. Shitaj. I know what you're thinking. You're visualizing this scene where your mom's banging on the door. <laughs> Like, Shitish, why is the door locked? <laughs> Mama, therapy. Uh. <laughs> That's what you are thinking, Shitish, you are correct. Video games are therapeutic. <laughs> Here's what I don't understand. I, I, I don't understand why there's so much of stigma around therapy. Yeah, you tell somebody you're going to see your therapist, you hear those words, right? We probably said it ourselves. Oh, pagal hai. <laughs> pagal hai. And I'm like, dude, if you have a mental illness and you don't go to a therapist, then you're crazy. Because think about this, we will willingly get any other part of our body examined, but not our minds. Like, Shitish, if you had piles... <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't laugh, it could happen to you as well. You put some MC here. Shitish, if you had piles, you know what I mean, right? You would willingly go to a doctor pull down your pants and stick your ass into his face. But you won't go to a therapist. Which is why now, in an attempt to remove some of the stigma around therapy, I'm trying to make therapy seem like a cool thing to do. So whenever I go to therapy, I brag about it. People ask me where I was, I'm like, I was in therapy, bitch. <laughs> what the fuck were you doing? I swear I've started making my friends feel bad for being normal. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you don't go to a therapist? You don't have a mental illness. She, what is wrong with you? <laughs> it's 2019, it's trending. <laughs> no, 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 you can't hang out with us. No, no. Hum sab pagal hai. <laughs> so the thing is, when you get news like this, okay, you have to process it on two levels. One is internally, where you have to come to terms with the fact that you have a condition like this that's going to be around for a very long time. And that takes a while. And then you have to deal with it externally. And it's slightly harder to deal with externally because we live in a world where there are other people. <laughs> How many of you, by round of applause, are at that stage of your life where you walk into a room and you go, <gasps> other people? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Homo sapiens. <laughs> Inhaling and exhaling. <laughs> voting for BJP. <laughs> And other people don't understand what it's like to have a mental illness, okay? And it's not entirely their fault for two reasons. One, I think we gave the illness the wrong name, okay? I think anxiety and depression does not fully communicate what goes on with us. 
mostly because of the word association. Like if I say anxiety, you think anxious. Or if I say depression, you think sad. That is not what this is. Like if I were to personify mental illness, I would say that anxiety and depression are the offspring of Cersei Lannister <laughs> and that clown from It. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Oh. Yeah, can you imagine what if Cersei and that clown had kids? <laughs> and what if those kids lived inside your head? That's exactly what it's like. Another reason why people don't understand what it's like to have a mental illness is because there's no physical manifestation of the illness. Right? Like if you have jaundice, your skin turns yellow, or if you get chicken pox, you get marks all over your body, or if you're a misogynist and a bigot, <laughs> the prime minister of the country follows you on Twitter. <laughs> we, we don't have that. And then it gets even harder to deal with other people because we also live in a world where everybody wants to know, what's the plan, guys? <laughs> Seen kya hai? <laughs> Do you realize this is a generation that has made the most plans? <laughs> Think about this, we are always making plans. You wake up in the morning with the three WhatsApp groups just for plans. <laughs> it's somebody's birthday, somebody's getting married, Shitij has piles, <laughs> plans. <laughs> And, and I'm very socially awkward, okay? I don't like feeling left out of stuff, so whenever I get invited to something, I always say yes, and then at the last minute, I cancel. <laughs> I don't know, how many of you feel the same way? Like, I, in my 30s, I find that canceling a plan is just as fulfilling as actually going out. <laughs> it's the same level of enjoyment. <laughs> and you don't even have to go through all the trouble of getting ready. <laughs> You can cancel a plan even when you're naked. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But then when you cancel a plan, you have to then have that awkward conversation with your friend, right? And it's not always pleasant, is it? Like I remember this one time I was supposed to meet a friend and I ended up having an anxiety attack. When you have one of those, you fall down a mental rabbit hole, okay? You can't function. So I had to call her up and tell her that I can't make it. And she said something to me, you should never say to someone with a mental illness. I called her up and I went, listen, I can't make it tonight, just had an anxiety attack, can't step out. And she said, stop this drama, ya. Yeah. It's all in your head. <laughs> <laughs> now, unless your brain is located in any other part of your body, <laughs> any mental illness is all in the head. Nobody has ever said, that lung cancer. <laughs> it's all in the lung. <laughs> I don't know what it is, it's like everybody has a certain bunch of friends whose only job is to say stupid shit. <laughs> All right? like, like I have another friend of mine, she also has anxiety disorder because more than one person can have it. <laughs> and one of her friends called her up once and went, hey, how is it going with that anxiety thing, yeah? <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck do you think, this is a relationship? <laughs> See, when we cancel a plan with you, no, uh, don't take it personally. It, it, it's not about you, it, it's about us. Sometimes it's about you. <laughs> Mostly it, it's about us. You know, we, we, we want to be normal, we, we want to do things like you do, but sometimes the mind just does not cooperate. I remember this one time I was getting ready to go meet some friends of mine and I ended up trying on 16 shirts. 16 shirts because every time I wore a shirt and looked into the mirror, my mind convinced me that I wasn't looking good. <laughs> I didn't know I had 16 shirts. <laughs> Halfway through I was like, when did I buy this? <laughs> so I, this just got very overwhelming, so I took my clothes off and cancelled the plan. <laughs> You really want to understand what it's like to have a mental illness until it creeps up on you from behind, grabs you by the neck and never lets you go. When I got diagnosed in 2016, you know, my mind would fixate on one particular fear and then drive me crazy every single day. Today, the fear manifests itself first and then looks for things to worry about. So I just spend my entire time dodging my own mind. It's easy to win a battle when the enemy's on the outside. You can see them, they have distinguishing features. But what if the enemy looks like you? What if the enemy is you? 
Sometimes my anxiety gets so bad, I have to plug in earphones and turn on the music really loud just so I can drown out the voices in my head. And it's kind of funny because these voices are saying really dark and nasty things. And suddenly they're forced to do karaoke. You're gonna die. Can you tell the valley gala? Can you tell the valley gala? Tell the valley gala? Can you guru darada? Then a suit suit to garada. What the fuck are you listening to? If you mess with me again, I'll play that selfie song. Our common side effect of mental illness is suicide. Sorry, side effect is the wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> I meant consequence. Uh, consequence is more apt. It's not like you get diagnosed and the doctor goes, you have depression, lock the windows, dismantle the fan. <laughs> no, that's not what I meant. What I, what I meant to say was that if you don't treat mental illness correctly, then the person with the illness could commit suicide. Uh, and this is something we read about in the news very often these days, don't we? But it's always when a famous person does it. Which again gives people the impression that, yeah, this could never happen to me. These rich people, <laughs> always doing drugs. <laughs> always. <laughs> Which is actually not true. Literally anyone with a mental illness could commit suicide. But nobody wants to read a headline that says, Praveen Tambe committed suicide. Because <laughs> of depression. <laughs> and I remember whenever I used to read these news headlines, I used to get very judgmental. You know, I used to be like, look at these celebrities, they're so rich. They're so successful, they have everything and they're still killing themselves. The ungrateful cowards. And then I got diagnosed and I was like, oh, <laughs> I see. Apparently, mental illness does not give a fuck about how much money you have, how successful you are. So what's the point of working so hard then? <laughs> so then I stopped judging because, because now I understand I, I'm on the same side, you know. Uh, these people, they, they don't kill themselves because they're ungrateful. They don't commit suicide because they're cowards. It takes a lot of guts to do it. They don't want to die. They just want whatever's going on in here to stop. And they will do whatever it takes to get there. It's a very twisted form of self-preservation. It's kind of like how you guys eat ice cream as comfort food when you're feeling low to feel better. That's exactly what suicide feels like for us. Suicide is ice cream for people with mental illness. <laughs> now, in order to make that joke work, what I thought I'd do is I'll distribute ice cream at the start of the show. <laughs> and then do this bit. Just to see the look on everybody's faces. This shit is too ikhale, yaar. In case you're wondering, uh, the answer to your question is yes. I have thought about my own suicide. You know, because comedy shows happen in the night. I have a lot of free time during the day. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> like, let me give you a glimpse into a day in my life before I got diagnosed, okay? I, I would wake up at 8 o'clock and then go back to sleep because I can. <laughs> And then I would wake up at 10, feed my cats, have breakfast, read the news, cook some food, have lunch. And then at 3 o'clock, I would watch Friends on Comedy Central. And at 3.30, I would be like, this has been a very stressful day. <laughs> now with the illness, it is all of that. Plus, I spend an additional six hours a day just doubting myself. Constantly beating myself up, trying to convince myself that I'm never going to make it in life. There are a lot of things I didn't know about this business. There are a lot of things you guys don't understand. For instance, when a gig gets over and the audience leaves and the lights go out, comedy is a very dark place. There are a lot of people that we have to deal with, mostly on the internet. And, and they're filled with so much of hate and insecurity. And for some reason, they feel the need to project that onto us. Other comedians will bitch about you and they can't wait for you to fail. People you work with in show business will stab you in the back without thinking twice. They forget that off stage and behind the Twitter handle is a real human being. You've seen how people talk to each other on the internet, haven't you? Very polite and articulate. 
I remember this one time somebody commented in one of the episodes on my podcast and he wrote, fix the audio, cunt face. <laughs> it was a very confusing comment. <laughs> because first of all, whose vagina looks like this? <laughs> and if it does, lucky you. <laughs> Stop looking downstairs now. <laughs> Shows up here. <laughs> but after the confusion died down, I realized that this guy was not angry about the audio. This was a cry for help. Because think about this, how many things have to go wrong in your life for you to get to a stage where you speak to total strangers like this? People in this room, you would never do something like that. Right? I realized this, this, this is a cry for help. Somebody needs to reach out to this guy and say something to him so that he feels better. So I replied. <laughs> I was like, hey man, just because your dad spoke to your mom the same way before leaving her, <laughs> doesn't mean you speak like that to me. Let's have some manners here. This is not your house. This is the internet. Enter. You guys are on my side, right? <laughs> I'm just checking. See, I have a simple rule, okay? Don't say something to somebody on the internet that you don't have the balls to say to them in real life. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah? It's because people like these, they don't understand what it takes to be so vulnerable with your craft and to put yourself out there for the whole world to judge. I mean, think about what you do for a living, right? Now imagine, what if everybody with access to the internet on this planet could see your work? any time they wanted. And what if they could then comment on your work, even if they weren't experts in your field? And suddenly you're waking up at 3 in the morning with a notification on your phone that says, Tu chutia hai. <laughs> <laughs> and I get that this is something that comes with the territory of what we do, okay? And I'm okay with that, which is why I also say that if you like an artist's work, whoever it is, an actor, a comedian, or a musician, let them know. Let them know because there are enough assholes out there who think that their only job in life is to bring us down a notch or two. Why? Because we have the guts to do what they can't. And let me say this, okay? We don't do this for money or fame. We do this because it's the only thing that makes us feel alive. <laughs> and the money is pretty amazing. <laughs> But sometimes when I think about this thing that I love doing in the world that I have to do it in, I'll be really honest, I have thought about killing myself. I've come really close a couple of times. This one time I was feeling suicidal and I told a friend of mine, she actually gave me suggestions as to how I could do it. <laughs> yeah, she's a very encouraging type. <laughs> you know, everybody has that one friend. <laughs> very supportive, believes in you no matter what. <laughs> she's that friend. Years ago, I told her, I'm going to try stand-up. She's like, you're, going to, you're very funny. Just go for it, you'll do really well. <laughs> I want to kill myself. Who better than you? <laughs> so she was of the opinion that I should make my suicide grand and spectacular. So she suggested that I jump out of an airplane <laughs> without a parachute while the plane is in the air. Otherwise, that would be a really bad YouTube video. <laughs> Get another comment. Let the plane take off, cunt face. <laughs> I thought about it for a while, and I realized that jumping out of an airplane without a parachute is not grand and spectacular, unless the jumping is preceded by, cunt pati bappa! <laughs> So I said, no, I don't want to do that. But she was like, okay, that's fine. I have an entire list. <laughs> and she pulls up a list of ways that I could kill myself. And number two on that list is cyanide. She's like, have cyanide? It's really quick. <laughs> I'm like, what's your hurry? <laughs> that's when I realized this girl would not be giving me so many suggestions if I owed her some money. <laughs> that's when I learned an important lesson. If you want your friends to prevent you from killing yourself, borrow money from them. <laughs> Even if you don't need it, borrow money from five different people, keep it inside a safe, that is real life insurance. <laughs> See, 
I don't want to jump out of an airplane or a building or any height because that's a very violent death. Probably very painful as well, you know. Like I, I don't want the scene of my death to be a mess. I don't want people gathering around me going, <gasps> <"Yeh kya hua?" laughs> And then they have to collect all my parts like ye, ye idhar la, ye kidhar, idhar la. Ye, ye kiska hai? Tera hai, uska hai. <laughs> Bhot bada hai, uska hai hoga, rakh la yaan pe. Ego, ego. <laughs> I want to have an open casket funeral. Which is why I've decided to take a more mature and responsible approach to my suicide. Drug overdose. <laughs> Figure at God on a high. And I don't want to have my funeral inside a church, you know. It's very 2005. Everybody's doing it. <laughs> Same thing. Huh? I want to have my funeral inside a comedy club. Yeah, and, and we'll sell tickets online. <laughs> we'll be sold out, obviously. And you can come for my funeral. You can, you'll be seated exactly like this, except I won't be standing here because I'm dead. But there'll be a casket. Uh, I'll be inside it. I'll be wearing a suit. It'll be open. My hair will be done. And, and obviously. <laughs> and then if you want, you can come up on stage and pay your last respects. Yeah. You can say something as well, but say something nice. Don't be mean, I might wake up. <laughs> and then once you're done, get your phone out and take one last selfie. One last selfie before they put me in the ground. And then as you're leaving, to make you feel better, somebody at the door will give you ice cream. <laughs> now I know I may have ruined ice cream for some of you. If I have, then good. Because now every time you eat ice cream, I want you to remember that somebody out there, somebody you know, might be having a hard time. So stay the fuck away from them. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see the look on your faces right now. You know this awkward tension that you're feeling? Because of what I've just said. I love it. <laughs> you don't know what to do with this. This was not the comedy show you were expecting. You're going to go home. Think about this show, probably going to post on social media, oh my god, I think I just attended Daniel Fernandez's last show. <laughs> what if you're right? <laughs> and if some of you are getting triggered by what I've just said, I want to let you know that I don't endorse suicide, okay? I'm not the brand ambassador. They haven't asked me yet. <laughs> I'm just saying that this is how I feel. It is okay to feel suicidal. It's a very human thing. It's the same thing. You know when you wake up in the morning and you don't feel like going to work? It's the same thing, but with life. So don't go around saying, Danny ne bola to mai bhi karega. <laughs> don't do that, guys. Plagiarism is not cool. <laughs> you know, when I wrote this part of the show about a year and a half ago, right? Um, I thought that I would tie this bit up with a... Uh, happy ending about how I overcame my illness and beat it and, and I won. But that hasn't happened. <laughs> Which is why some of my friends asked me, then why are you talking about this? And I think the reason why I'm talking about my mental illness in my stand-up is because, if I, I, because I feel that if I do this, then maybe I won't feel so alone. And if there are other people in the audience who are going through the same thing, then maybe they won't feel alone either because there's a certain comfort in your suffering when you realize that you are not the only one being fucked. <laughs> you remember when we were in school and you had a test and you didn't study for the test? You knew you were going to fail. You felt really bad, didn't you? But then you met somebody else who also didn't study for the test. <laughs> and suddenly your day became brighter. <laughs> You're like, I didn't study for the test. I didn't study either, bro! <laughs> and then he passes the test. <laughs> so basically what I'm trying to say is that some of you will die before me. <laughs> and that thought gives me a lot of comfort. <laughs> so thank you. Piles doesn't kill people, uh, from what I know. <laughs> uh, 
do you guys feel that growing up like you had certain plans in life like you thought that you'd be doing certain things by a certain age and that hasn't happened yeah a lot of you do right like nobody ever goes yeah no 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 everything always worked out <laughs> i have an excel list check 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 no never happened all of us thought our life would go a certain way it didn't work out and one of the things i thought that i'd do by this age is i thought i'd be a parent and then 3 years ago i found out that before you become a parent to your future kids you have to become a parent to your parents did you know this i i i found out 3 years ago we we were Uh, we were on a holiday in singapore i was with my family and we were walking down orchard street and i was leading the way because i knew where we had to go right and at some point i turned around to see where the rest of my family was and my mom and dad were lagging behind they were like son wait don't walk so fast and that's when it hit me i was like shit my parents have become old they've aged mortality has a strange way of reminding you it exists Because as kids, you always have this image of your parents, right? They're young and they're strong, and nothing will ever happen to them. But as you get older, that image starts to fade as you watch them crumble before your eyes. And it took me back in time to when I was a child. You know, we would go on family holidays. My dad was the one leading the way because he knew where everything was. I was the one lagging behind. I was the one going, "Dad, wait! Don't walk so fast. I'm coming." And my dad would very lovingly look at my mom and say. What the fuck is wrong with this kid? <laughs> How difficult is it to put one foot in front of the other <laughs> quickly? <laughs> Sell him. <laughs> Now years later I'm all grown up and I'm taking care of them. We go out, I ask them what they want to eat and I pay for stuff. And it took me a while to get used to this okay but i've realized something i realized that out of all the things that you could do after you grow up one of the best things you can do with your life is take care of your parents and if you're not doing that you must do it you must take care of your parents not because it's the right thing to do but because when you become a parent to your parents your life will be full of comedy <laughs> it's the funniest shit ever <laughs> So let me give you an example okay you remember when we were kids and we wanted something we just asked for it and you didn't care about where it came from how much it cost or what it took to get it right you wanted something you asked for it when you become a parent to your parents they will do the same thing to you <laughs> except when they ask for stuff they will factor in inflation <laughs> and no matter what their background is their calculations are always correct <laughs> like i remember when i was a child i would ask for really frivolous stuff i'd be like mom give me money for chocolate Give me money for Pepsi. This wasn't Pepsi Cola. This was that frozen popsicle <laughs> that came in that plastic tube that you just bit into and went. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> like in the 90s, that is all we did. Just. <laughs> <laughs> like there are people today in the West who are wondering why Indians are such good kissers. <laughs> they have no idea we've been practicing since childhood <laughs> they think it's the kama sutra <laughs> no bitch it's pepsi that's all we did <laughs> and there would always be this one asshole friend who would go ye gutter ka pani hai <laughs> Do you guys realize that gutter ka pani hai is the first fake news in India? <laughs> Think about this. There was no WhatsApp back then. We've never met prior to today. We've all probably grown up in different parts of the city or the country yet collectively we've all had the exact same experience. How is that possible? <laughs> I have a theory. I think that many many years ago there was this one parent probably from Gujarat <laughs> who didn't want his child to have Pepsi. So he said ye gutter ka pani hai. 
सो द चाइल्ड सेट ठीक है मैं चाय बना लेता हूँ and then that child told his friend amit <laughs> and amit told his friend and his friend and his friend and that's how it spread across the country <laughs> and if you think about it they weren't too far off because in 2019 the color of gutter ka pani is orange <laughs> So yeah, that's the kind of stuff I would ask for, you know, chocolates and Pepsi. But my mom takes it to a whole new level. This one time I was sitting with her, she was like, "Dan, I want a fully automatic washing machine." I was like, "But we have a fully functional semi-automatic washing machine. What's wrong with that?" She's like, "No, no, no. The thing is, all my neighbors have a fully automatic washing machine. <laughs> so I just went. If your neighbors jump inside a well." <laughs> Oh my God! I have turned into you. <laughs> I just got her a fully automatic washing machine. That's how you find out. And then a few months later, I was with my dad, and my dad asked me, "Son, I I want an HD TV." <laughs> and I'm really happy that I'm fortunate enough to not be one of those parents who has to make up a story because they can't give their child something. You know, we've all been there. I'm glad when my dad asked me for an HD TV, I didn't have to go HD TV. Why do you need an HD TV? <laughs> When I was a child, <laughs> I didn't have HD TV. <laughs> I just used my imagination. He's <laughs> got him an HD TV, and it's stuff like these that remind me that my parents have now become my children. And there's this other thing that they started doing, and I'm probably probably seen this with your parents as well. Have you ever noticed your parents arguing for no reason? <laughs> Yeah, they're not upset about something. They just argue <laughs> because there's nothing else to do, <laughs> right? Your parents do that, right? Like there's only so much sex they can have. <laughs> like, go on. <laughs> Are you thinking about your parents having sex right now? Thank you. I mean, statistically, there are enough people in here to say that some of your parents are having sex right now while you are at the show. I love how when you describe or talk about something like this, it makes you very awkward, doesn't it? <laughs> this, is, this happens only with Indian kids, because all Indian kids are like, no, no, my parents don't have sex. <laughs> Just once, <laughs> then they stopped. <laughs> And in the off chance that some of you are progressive enough to admit that, yeah, your parents do have sex, even you guys. Think that they do it in just one position, <laughs> missionary. <laughs> like not one of you maybe thought about the fact that your mom likes it doggy style. <laughs> so dad just bends her over and just lifts the leg up and just lets her have it, like you know. <laughs> But some of them are here with their parents. Just think about that <laughs> for a second. <laughs> like think about how awkward dinner is going to be tonight. <laughs> Like, beta, what's wrong? No, mom, I have a headache. <laughs> Don't lie, I know you're faking it. <laughs> so my parents do that a lot, and they argue for for no reason at all. You know, and this one time when I was visiting, they live in Goa, uh, and I was visiting, uh, and they started arguing in front of me for no reason, and I was trying to get some work done, and it was just bothering me, you know. So I just like switched to parent mode, and I was like, mom, dad, just stop this arguing. Okay, stop arguing. This, this makes no sense. Stop it. Dad, go to your room. <laughs> Mom, go to the same room. <laughs> so my dad turned around and went like, "Hey, this is still our house. <laughs> you go to your room. <laughs> and if you don't like it, go to Pakistan." <laughs> I told you to sell him. <laughs> As you can tell, I was raised in India. I assume everybody else over here raised in India. Yes, if you were raised in India right, as a child, all of you were asked this one question: What do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> right? Seemingly harmless question at first, 
but then over the years people will ask you this question over and over and over again till you get to a stage where you just start hating people <laughs> and questions <laughs> It was very weird because I could never answer this question. I didn't know how to respond, right? My friends would go for the usual stereotypes. They would go like, you know, doctor, lawyer, drug dealer. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in Goa. <laughs> and they became all of those things. <laughs> But I could never respond to this question. I didn't know how to respond, you know, because as a child I had very weird theories. Like, you know, as children, sometimes you have theories about life that only you believe. Like, one of the theories I had as a child was, I believed that your profession was coded in your DNA. You didn't get to choose what you wanted to be. It was a part of your DNA. That's because I grew up watching a lot of National Geographic and Animal Planet <laughs> whenever my parents were at home. <laughs> So you've all seen these documentaries, right? Like a deer gives birth to a fawn, and within a few seconds the fawn is ready to face the world. You know, and then how does the fawn know that when it sees a lion, it is not supposed to go, hey bro, what's up? <laughs> how does that fawn know that when it sees the lion, it is supposed to go, bhaag <laughs> That's because everything that is required for it to be a deer is in its DNA. Similarly, I thought your profession was coded in your DNA. You became a doctor because it was in your DNA. You became a lawyer because it was in your DNA. You became a drug dealer because it was in your blood. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up very confused because I didn't have that answer, you know. And I always thought that there was something wrong with me. And then years later, it turns out that something is wrong with me. Okay, not something, many things, but... <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, I know that I've already shared a lot of personal stuff uh, with, with you, but it's very embarrassing to admit this. So I hope you won't tell other people I said this, but uh, here's what's wrong with me, okay? Uh, I cannot conform to the Indian blueprint for success. Uh, I guess familiar with the Indian blueprint for success. That nine-point plan that we were taught as kids is the only way to live. Familiar? Go to school, go to college, get a job, get married, have kids, buy an apartment on an EMI, spend 30 years of your life paying off that EMI, retire, die. <laughs> Sounds familiar? Yeah. Like all of us have been part of that plan in some way or another, right? Like, and full respect to anybody who might have pulled that off for yourselves or your family. Like, well done, Talia. But uh, <laughs> I, I look at this nine-point plan and I'm like, man, this is too normal, okay? And normal is very boring because as an adult, I now have another theory. Here's my theory, right? If you live long enough, you will become old. <laughs> I know what some of you are thinking right now. We paid 500 bucks for this. <laughs> what is Captain Obvious going to say next? <laughs> if you flush the toilet, nobody will know you were there. <laughs> no, no, I'm going somewhere with this, okay? If you live long enough, you will become old. And when you become old, you will feel left out. And I don't know if you ever noticed, whenever an older person is speaking to a younger person, most often than not, they're always talking about how things used to be back in the day and talking about their achievements and their legacy is because they have realized something. They have realized that their time is almost up. So all they have left is everything that they used to do when they were younger, and they want people to remember that. Which is why when I get really old and I'm trying to impress my grandkids with my achievements and my legacy, I don't want to say something like, hey kids, come here. <laughs> Let me tell you about how I used to pay my EMIs on time. <laughs> Tenth of every month, money would go out of my account. <laughs> HDFC thought I was a wild child. <laughs> Word. <laughs> no, I, I can't do that. Like, I've, I've, the thing is, I've, I've come to realize that life is too short, and in whatever way possible, you must live a life of adventure, you know? So when you get really old, and you're looking back at all the things that you've done, the only thought that should come to your mind should be, how the fuck am I not in prison? <laughs> yeah? And out of this nine-point plan, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but owning an apartment in this country is considered to be some major achievement. Yeah? Like young India is obsessed with owning apartments. Like, I've never seen grown-ass people get so excited about brick, cement, and paint. 
you know what I'm talking about, right? Have you met these smug homeowners? Yeah, homeowners. <laughs> these people who think they own the apartment that the bank lets them have against a monthly payment. <laughs> which common folk call rent. <laughs> you met them, you go to their house, the first thing they'll do, the first thing they'll do is tell you how big the house is. It's the first thing they'll tell you. 1,800 square feet. All mine. <laughs> 1,800. Mine, mine. And then they'll ask you, what about you, Dan? What about you? And then I'll say something really philosophical just to fuck with them. <laughs> I'll just be like, the earth is my home. <laughs> 510 million square kilometers, fuck your 1800 square feet. <laughs> shanti, 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 shanti. <laughs> they don't give up. They feel the need to convince you to also buy an apartment. And all of them have the exact same argument. It's a good investment. And they all say it the same way. All of them channeling the inner Shashi Tarur. <laughs> it's a good investment. And I'm like, no, it's not. Because by the time you end up owning the apartment, like you're really old, you have arthritis, your wife has left you, <laughs> your kids don't want to live with you anymore. You'll meet them at a comedy show once in a while, but, uh, <laughs> you know? And, and then you're just sitting there doing nothing with your life. Like that, that just sounds so empty. So I don't care about your three BHK, I'd rather have a threesome. Ah, how, many, how many of you over here have had a threesome? Yeah? How many of you would like to have a threesome? Like three dudes have uh, raised their hands here. <laughs> you guys are thankfully sitting next to each other. After the show. <laughs> Create a WhatsApp group. Make a plan. <laughs> Don't cancel. <laughs> it's a good investment. <laughs> no, it's not. An apartment is not a good investment. You know what's a good investment? Memories. That's a good investment. Here's another good investment. Travel. Yeah, that's a good investment. Yeah. Have you ever done this? Have you ever traveled to another country, met somebody for the first time, spent an entire day with them, knowing fully well that you will never see them ever again? Anyone done that? Yeah? Yeah, awesome. You've been to Amsterdam. Nice. <laughs> Footnote, it takes some people two weeks to get that joke. <laughs> two weeks from now, people will be messaging me on Instagram. Oh! <laughs> but you must try this. If you've never done this, travel to another country, meet somebody for the first time, spend an entire day with them knowing fully well that you will never see them ever again. You will find out who you really are. Cheap. <laughs> and it's because we've been taught that this is the only way to live, right? Then we then spend most of our adult life just chasing after stuff, right? Like the job, the marriage, the kids, the apartment, we're just chasing things. And sometimes it works out for you, which is good, but sometimes it just spectacularly fails. And that's what happened to me in 2011. 2011 is when I hit rock bottom. That was my rock bottom moment. You guys familiar with the term? Yeah, rock bottom is basically when your life completely falls apart. You question all the decisions you ever made and wonder how you're gonna get out of there. Rock bottom is when life takes you and slams you to the ground and asks you, do you smell what life is cooking? <laughs> Two thousand and eleven was one of the toughest years of my life. You know, I was in a job that was going nowhere, paying me very little money. I just started doing comedy. There was no future in it at that time. And the girl that I was in love with for two and a half years broke up with me over the phone. Who gets better? <laughs> she then married one of our juniors from our MBA college. Gets even better. This junior was one of the few guys I dragged as a senior when he joined the college, out of all the ways that he could get back at me. <laughs> this was the best. Like, can you imagine me being an asshole to him in college? I'm like, what are you going to do? Huh? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> and in his head, he's just thinking, I'll tell you what I'll do. 
I'm going to study really hard, get my degree, a job, and then I'll marry your girlfriend. <laughs> and he actually did it. Full respect to him. He actually did it. He pulled it off. I mean, respect, man. Like, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. There's no comeback to this. There's no comeback to this. What am I going to do? Have an affair with my ex-girlfriend who's now his wife? <laughs> I would never do that. That's not who I am. <laughs> Guys, come on. Hey. hey, you know me. Come on. I would never do that. Again. <laughs> that breakup taught me something. Okay, I want to share this with you. Uh, how many of you over here are dating? Not married? Dating? Couples over here? Yeah? You guys do a few dating? Two of you together? Oh, that's really cute. That's nice. Is that true, ma'am? Or you just... <laughs> How long have you guys been together? Two months. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cute. <laughs> okay, she's going to break up with you, alright? <laughs> I mean, let me be honest, he's not the last guy you're going to have sex with. <laughs> you know, right, you guys are each other's trial period. How, how old are you? 21. Oh. <laughs> Look at the experience over there. <laughs> You're like, wait till you get to 35. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, she, she, she's going to break up with you, okay? When you break up with him, now, don't do it over the phone. That's, that's the one tip. Don't do it over the phone. It, it hurts a lot. Like, like, I've been there, okay? See, you've been with this person for a certain amount of time, right? You've shared a life with them. You've discussed a future that you could possibly have. The least you can do when you realize that it is not working out is sit across the person face to face and make sure they're crying. <laughs> yeah. If you're breaking up with somebody, you have to make sure they're crying. Because if you're breaking up with them and they're not crying, you're the one being dumped. <laughs> So yeah, and I, I'm 2011, uh, I'm heartbroken in a job that's going nowhere, and I have no plan for the future. And again, I hear that voice in my head asking me, what do you want to do when you grow up? Except I was 27. <laughs> so already grown up. <laughs> you know that thing, right? You think, yeah, by my mid-20s, I'm going to be settled. Uh, no, very, very far from it. I did everything they told me to do, and I wasn't happy. It's only years later, I realized I started becoming happy the day I did everything they told me not to do. But back then, I was a mess. And I'm just sitting there and going, like, what is happening? Like, I'm looking at this nine-point plan. I'm like, first of all, nine things, too much to do in one <laughs> lifetime. I'm going. <laughs> ambition is not our thing. <laughs> a Goan's idea of ambition is leaning out the window to see if a coconut has fallen. <laughs> I'm like, I can't do nine things, okay? Let me try and do something that doesn't require that much effort. I said, four things. Four things, reasonable. Anybody can do four things. These are four simple things. So I created my own plan. I'm like, these are four things I want. I wanted a career that was creative, a career where I could travel all over the world, a career where I could take leave whenever I want for as long as I want, and most importantly, a career where I didn't have to wake up before 11 a.m. Yeah? Anyone can have this. Anyone, right? So whenever people ask me what you're trying to do, I'm like, yeah, this is what I'm trying to do with my life. You know, it's just like just after my MBA, and then my friends stopped hanging out with me. <laughs> and they're like, he's not paying his share of the bill. <laughs> and then a uh, few weeks later, there was a family function. Okay, we just have uh, all the cousins and everybody were there, and, and all the uncle and aunts were playing that game they do, na? Whose child turned out the best? <laughs> They were playing that game and they asked me, you know, so what are you doing with your life right now? And I told them, these are the four things I'm trying to do. So one of my aunts laughed out really loud, she got very sarcastic, and she looked at my mom and said, why don't you put him up for adoption? <laughs> but don't worry, my mom defended me, okay? She was like, no, how dare you say something like that? Don't you dare. We're trying to sell him. <laughs>
And on the same time, I had a very profound conversation with one of my uncles, okay? He said something to me that really shook me up and something that I will never forget for the rest of my life. He said, Dan, there are only three kinds of people in the world. Number one, people who realize very early on in life what they were meant to do. Two, people who realize later on in life what they were meant to do. Three, people who never realize what they were meant to do. And I was like, whoa, nice. <laughs> <laughs> that really shook me up. I was like, holy shit, I'm 27. It's too old to be number one. It's either going to be number two or number three. And that's one of those conversations where you just wake up, I need to do something with my life. I need to do something with my life. So I went out and I got tickets to a Metallica concert. <laughs> yeah. 2011, Metallica came to India. They had two gigs. One in Gurgaon, the other in Bangalore. The one in Gurgaon got cancelled because it was Gurgaon. <laughs> I had tickets for Bangalore. Okay, everybody here familiar with who Metallica is? Yeah, yeah, legends of heavy metal music. Okay, I grew up listening to them, watched all their videos on MTV, have all their tapes. So watching Metallica live was a big deal for me. Kind of like how it is for some of you watching me. <laughs> yeah. So I'm at this gig now, and I have no idea this gig is going to change my life, okay? Because I'm standing 15 feet away from James Hetfield. James Hetfield is the lead singer of the band. At that time, he was in his late 40s, but he was killing it on stage and having such a good time as if he was in his 20s. And I was like, holy shit. That's so amazing to see somebody be this passionate about life at that age. And that's when it hit me. I was like, man, James Hetfield has a creative job. James Hetfield travels all over the world. James Hetfield can take leave whenever he wants for as long as he wants. And most importantly, James Hetfield does not have to wake up before 11 a.m. And that's when I decided I'm going to be the James Hetfield of stand-up. Yeah. And I yelled it out, I'm going to be the James Hetfield of stand-up. And let me tell you something. Nobody gives a fuck about who you want to be. <laughs> if you're blocking their view at a concert. <laughs> so I flew back to Bombay the next day and I fired myself. I decided I was never going to work for anybody ever again. But it was a very funny thing because the people I worked for, they were really nice, but they were upset that I went for the gig without telling them. <laughs> so they were preparing for one of those, we are going to fuck you up meetings. Now, if you've ever had a job long enough, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You did something at the office that pissed your boss off, right? So he or she called you for a meeting into their cabin. Shushma from HR was there. <laughs> and then they spend the first five minutes making you feel bad about what you did. And the next five minutes reminding you about why you need that job so you can have a life. <laughs> Been there? Yeah? That is what I was walking into. And whenever these meetings take place, right, your boss rehearses what he or she is going to say, right? They're not very talented people. <laughs> they have come prepared. So the same way I was walking to one of these meetings where my bosses were ready to say stuff to me, except I walked in, fucked myself up before they could say anything and walked out, and they were very confused. <laughs> they were like, he has already left. <laughs> what do we do with all these words? It's like you're about to have sex with somebody, but then they masturbate and leave. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, of course. <laughs> so there I was, November 1st, 2011. No job, no money, heartbroken, but following my dreams. And here's the thing motivational videos don't tell you when they ask you to follow your dreams is that those dreams could turn into nightmares real fast if you don't get validation for the choices you've made. And at that time, I didn't know it would take me five whole years to get that validation. And after doing this for eight years now, I've come to realize that not everybody should follow their dreams. <laughs> we need people in the audience. <laughs> So learn to love your job. <laughs> but back then when I decided to quit my job to do comedy, there was no money in comedy at all. So I had to do whatever it took to pay the bills. So I would write uh, random articles, you know, for websites and stuff. And <laughs> some of these articles I'm okay with, some of them not so much. 
which is why I'm really glad that in 2012, Stand Up finally started paying us some money. Because somewhere out there in the universe is an article titled, Sensual Massages, <laughs> written by Daniel Fernandez. <laughs> Around the same time, about a month later after I quit, uh, December 2011, I went to Goa. I was still heartbroken, I was still messed up, I was trying to figure shit out. And uh, my friends took me to this place called Club Cabana for a party, you know. And it was very nice, met a lot of people, we had a great time. And I was speaking to this one particular girl, right? And at some point of the conversation, she asked me, what do you do for a living? And for the first time in 27 years, I had an answer. I looked at her and I said, I'm a comedian. Yeah. <laughs> and she replied, are you funny? <laughs> Uh, humor, humor is subjective. <laughs> what is funny to some may not be funny to... Are you funny or not? <laughs> and I'm like, look, I don't know, okay? I just found out I'm a comedian. <laughs> I don't know. I then said to her, I don't know if I'm funny or not, but I'm going to work really hard and one day I'm going to perform all over the world. And she was like, ooh, <laughs> such a nice answer. <laughs> like, okay, let's do this, okay? Let's take a picture together just in case what you said comes true. I don't know if she was being sarcastic. I just heard, let's take a picture. I'm like, I'm there. <laughs> so we took a picture with her, me, and my friend. And it's now on my Instagram. Um, but I didn't see her after that. Five years later, I was fortunate enough to be performing at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival in 2016 in Australia. I was headlining some 22 shows. Yeah. And after one of these shows, I felt a tap on my shoulder. And as I turned around, I heard a voice that asked me, do you remember me? And I just went, no. <laughs> Have you read my article on sensual massages? <laughs> and she said, no, but I met you at a club in Goa five years ago. And I asked you what you did for a living. You said you were a comedian. And I asked you if you were funny. You said you weren't sure, but you're going to work really hard. And one day, you're going to perform all over the world. And then she reached into her pocket and pulled out a phone and showed me the picture we took from five years ago and said, I'm so proud of you. And I remember that moment so well as I was consumed by emotion, as I looked at that picture and thought to myself, who uses the same phone <laughs> for five years? <laughs> and that is how I answered the question, what do you want to do when you grow up? It took me 27 years. Except a few years later, they asked me another question. When are you getting married? <laughs> and that's when I realized life is just a series of questions that we must answer. What do you want to do when you grow up? When are you getting married? Mandir kaha banega? <laughs> Again, I don't have an answer to this question. And before I tell you why I don't have an answer, let me give you some backstory, okay? I'm 35 and I'm single, which means that I have been in enough relationships by now to safely conclude that when it comes to love, I have a failure rate of 100%. <laughs> and those are not good numbers. Like, sometimes I feel that I'm just meant to be single. Like, I feel like I'm single the same way some people are vegetarian. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, but it's a thing. <laughs> and I have no problem with being single in my 30s, except I'm single in my 30s in a world where there are other people. <laughs> and other people can't handle people who are single, especially in their 30s. You know what I'm talking about, right? They'll always come up to you and give you unwanted advice, telling you stuff you don't need to hear. <laughs> this one time somebody came up to me and said, like, you know, Dan, let me tell you why you're single. <laughs> you don't know, I know. <laughs> and I'm just like, but first tell me, who are you? <laughs> He's like, no, that doesn't matter. I'll tell you why you are single. The reason why you are single, Dan, the reason why you are single is because you haven't met the one. Oh. 
I, exactly. <laughs> You've all heard this bullshit at some point in time in your life, right? This magical person called the one. <laughs> this love child of a unicorn and a yeti. <laughs> now let me tell you something. There's no such thing as the one. Okay, the one is just some bullshit story that somebody made up so De Beers could sell you diamonds. <laughs> yeah, for years, capitalism has successfully convinced us that jewelry is evidence of love. Think about this, yeah. First, De Beers started with that fantastic tagline, right? A diamond is forever. And I'm like, well, relationships are not. <laughs> then somebody else sang a song, a diamond is a girl's best friend. So why are you asking the men to buy them? <laughs> and here's the latest marketing scam, okay? I don't know if you know this, but now they've come up with a formula to prove your love. And men, this is for you. If you really love your woman, you will buy her a diamond engagement ring worth three times your monthly salary. Did you know this? Yeah. When I heard this, I was like, are you nuts? I'm not spending 30 lakhs on a ring. <laughs> what? Man. <laughs> See the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> Is that there's no such thing as the one. See, if you're in a relationship, if, like if you're dating or if you're married, good for you. But you're not with the one. You're with someone. <laughs> who probably just gave up and settled for you. <laughs> and if you want to know which one you are in the relationship, stand in front of a mirror with your partner and the first one to smile wins. <laughs> now let me tell you why I don't have an answer to the question, when are you getting married? It's because a lot of people have told me not to get married. And all the people who've told me not to get married are divorced. <laughs> Can we for a second address the high divorce rates in our generation? Yeah? Like it's just a normal thing now. Everybody in here knows at least one person who's divorced. No, I know 10. <laughs> and a lot of people say that our generation does not do what it takes to be happy. Yeah, yeah. Like this behavior was unheard of in our parents' time, right? Like in our parents' time, if a marriage was not working out, they did the right thing and waited till one of them died. <laughs> yeah, they played Russian roulette with their happiness. Could be him, could be me, could be him, could be me. Oh, it's him. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever noticed one of your parents is staring at a watch way too often? <laughs> Even married people are telling me not to get married. And I'm not the only one who's had a conversation like this, okay? Met a friend of mine this one time, he was like, Dan, are you single? I'm like, yeah, stay single. <laughs> stay single. And I'm like, dude, what happened? Just do it, okay? Just do it. I'm like, okay, Nike, but... Uh, aren't you married? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm married. Aren't you happy? Marriage is not about happiness. <laughs> Never met him again after that. <laughs> and you have similar conversations as well, right? And it's confused me so much. Like, let me give you a better analogy okay, as to how I'm feeling right now. Like, let's say you're at a party. And at some part of the party, you decide to go to the toilet. Right? You, you just think, like, yeah, I'm at an age where I can go to the toilet. <laughs> I can handle the responsibility that comes with going to the toilet. So I will go to the toilet. <laughs> And you go to the toilet, except there's somebody already inside, so you just wait for them to come out. But as soon as they come out, the first thing they say to you is, do not go in there. <laughs> Oof, that shit is messed up. It stinks. What would you do? Would you go to the toilet? No. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that marriage is a toilet <laughs> that people keep telling me not to use, which is why I'm pissing in the bushes. <laughs> See, I, I do want to answer that question. Like, I want to answer that question, when are you getting married? 
which is why uh, I am now on the lookout for my first wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Figure I'd give this a couple of tries. You know? I just hope my first wife does not watch this show. <laughs> on second thought, maybe she should. She should know what she's getting into. But then again, no smart woman will watch the show and will want to be with me, right? Like, think about this. I'm suicidal. I tell jokes for a living, and I think marriage is a toilet. <laughs> That's the worst matrimonial ad ever. <laughs> like, Shadi.com saw my profile, and they swipe left. <laughs> Which is why now, every day I wake up, I believe a little less in the idea of love. Like every day I now wake up, I believe that I'm never going to meet somebody I can share my life with. And that's OK. I'm OK with that. Unless some girl comes to the show, watches this and goes, <laughs> oh. Oh. Let's buy him. So yeah, those were the last eight years of my life. And everything that has happened to me in these eight years has made me a certain kind of person, you know? Like some days are really, really good, and then some days are really, really bad. But the one thing that gets me through all of it is getting up on stage and telling you guys jokes. Which is why, if you now think about it, stand-up is actually therapy for me. Because I'm standing across a room full of total strangers, telling them my deepest, darkest secrets, except they are paying me <laughs> a lot of money. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniel Fernandez. Thank you, Nike, for the speaker. Speaker, best in my house. Just in office, you were the best. I remember how you said it. Your ball was too big. You were the ball, you were the ball. Jackie Chan, I was the ball. Dragon fire, my verse of Spitfire. Hey, Khas, Sapna, Dub, Charma, Drona, Charya. I love you, I am your love. Then I saw you with both hands. I saw you with both hands. I saw you with both hands. है आजादी छह छह करता देखो अरना बस कब तक देखे किसका व्हाट्सएप सच्चा और किसका करता जे एन यू की बातों से क्यों डरता मंत्री उसका बग बग क्यों बातों पे पड़ती लाठी बोलो अरना बोलो अरना चला पूछ जाके साले अपना साले चला पूछ जाके साले अपना साले चला पूछ जाके साले अपना साले चला पूछ जाके साले ना फैशन पे ना स्नीकर पे ना पूरिया ना मेरा क्रू ना मुझको जाने तेरी दुनिया दिल से करता तो होता सारा काम बढ़िया फिर क्यों तू जलता खन के तेरी माँ की चूरिया सब सब का चाटे बातें फीकी लाल आंखें इनके चेले मुस्कराते हाँ पे हाँ ये सब मिलाते इनके नाते इनके नाके में बैठे सारे इलाके के फरे भी सब हिलाते अपना फिर जाके सो जाते मैं ना मानूं इनकी बातें लिख के कटती हैं ये रातें सपनों के पीछे हम भागे आगे देखे हम क्या लाते आगे देखे हम फैलाते मुद्दा मंजिल और but that breakup taught me a very important lesson. I want to share that with you. Okay? How many of you are here? Couples uh, dating, not married. People who are uh, dating anyway, over here? Couples, yeah, yeah, dating. All the single people showed up at the show. <laughs> There's another WhatsApp group, is it? <laughs> single people in Mumbai looking for comedy. <laughs> Not one of you over here. 
Yeah, in couples. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. It's being taped, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Just fucking... <laughs> like... There's a couple at the back, right? I remember. <laughs> no, I'm just fishing in the dark. <laughs> Fall in love, hurry up! So, you're, you're dating somebody? For your show, I'm dating. For your show, you're dating. I don't want this pretty fucking relationship. Fuck off. You're not doing it for your show. Like, as if he's banging chicks every night. Like, oh, just, just give me my cock a break tonight. And just for your show, I'll be monogamous. Yeah, for your... <laughs> The light is reflecting, I can see you. Just <laughs> so I like his confidence for your show, man. Seriously. <laughs> 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 <laughs>